Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to this sacred space. I very often just decide to um, to do these videos when it feels like a good a good time to do it. So now felt like a good time. I've had my smoothie. You can see um, a video of the smoothie that I made this morning, it's on my timeline. So I'd just like to welcome you all into this sacred space and um, this might be half an hour, it might be an hour, it won't be any longer than an hour and I'm just going to share some things with you and as usual I don't really have much prepared but I do have some books in front of me that I'll be reading from. So. Um, Welcome to my little space here, my little conservatory that's full of beautiful things, crystals and plants and music and beautiful books and photos of Osho and Ramana Maharshi and I've got Mother Mira over there and it's all happening in this space. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Shibu. Good morning, Mariam and Joanne. Please um, let me know where you're tuning in from and say hi to each other. And we've all called each other here um, for this. Hi, Matthew. <laughs> so. Um, let's just take a couple of minutes to just bring ourselves into this space and just really take some breaths, feel where your body is at, feel what's happening with your body, feel what's happening in your heart. There's been so much going on in the world the last few days. There have been so many concerts for peace, there have been marches for women, the inauguration of the new American president. There's been a lot of stuff happening. And there's always this possibility that we can get totally wrapped up in all the dramas that are going on in the world and um, it's really it's about staying you know staying in our center staying with what we know is real and true there's always dramas going on in the world they play out in many different ways and there's nothing bad that is actually happening you know everything that's happening right now is for our expansion for our growth as humanity as a planet you know as this experience and so we need to remain mindful not to get caught up in the drama and then not to actually create the thing that we that we are that we want to avoid you know there's a lot of women at the moment that are feeling very angry with the situation but anger and hate and shouting and chanting hateful things is not helpful um we need to remember that we are the space in which all of life is being experienced. And to come back to the peace that we are within. If we try to change the world by being, by becoming that which we don't want to see, it's not going to work. 
And change starts within each and every one of us. And the media is perpetuating an idea that everything is doomed. You know, that this is, this is not good. That would the alternative be any better? I'm not so sure the alternative is any better. But what we need to keep in our hearts is that nothing is actually going wrong, no matter how it looks how crazy, how intense the drama and how everybody's getting on this the, the latest bandwagon, you know? Anything to distract us from what's real and true. And look how quickly we jump. Look how quickly we take that that leap to what what is shown, you know? Everybody jumps, don't they? So quickly their mind just grabs onto the next thing that's happening, the next unfolding in the world, the next the next story, the next complicated story. And we're not that story. It's happening. It's happening so people can experience different things, so they can understand their boundaries and their limitations. But we need to stay mindful. What do we really want to stand for? What do we really want to be? What do we really want to be in this world? Right here, right now. Now, what's important to us? Let's not get caught up in all the drama and all the craziness. Because it's actually perfect. It just looks crazy. But everybody is getting the lesson that they need from that drama. Everybody is getting the growth that they need, the understanding that they need. Everyone's making new decisions in the way that they need to. You know, this is how life is. Nothing is ever happening to hurt us or harm us. It's all for our growth, for our, for our expansion, you know, our expansion into a deeper self. Hi Trevor, hi Cheryl, I'm just reading your comment, Dave. Challenges in life, you know, every, every challenge that comes along, all the suffering is to show us that we are not that. You know, we have a body so that we can learn that we are not the body, that we are not limited to the body. We have a mind so that we can see that we are not the mind and we're not limited to the mind. And we're experiencing this world, but we're by no means limited by this world. This world comes out of our beliefs, our conditionings, our ideas, our thought patterns about what's possible for each and every one of us. And so collectively, when we want to make a difference, we make that difference by tuning into the peace within us, not tuning into the drama, because that just creates more drama. Something Gandhi said, an eye for an eye, and the whole world goes blind. Let's stay awake, let's stay aware. I'm gonna to read today's opening doors within. 
by Eileen Caddy. I just had to switch the heater off, it's getting very warm in here. Um, today's date is January the 23rd. Why put off until later something that is your divine heritage now? I am within you, closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. Can you accept it? Or do you still have doubts and wonder if it is possible? It is something all individuals have to work out for themselves. They can be told it over and over again, but until they are willing to accept it as fact and to know the wonder of it, it means nothing to them. Or it is just a lovely dream that perhaps one day may become reality. What time is wasted in doubting and disbelief? It is only when you know the truth that the truth sets you free. Hearing about it, talking about it or reading about it does not do it. The truth has to live and move and have its being within you. Then it does set you free and you know the true meaning of freedom of the heart, mind and spirit. I'm going to read from Spiritual Diary now by Paramahansa Yogananda. It's just a little short passage for today. Everyone should learn to analyse himself dispassionately. Write down your thoughts and aspirations daily. Find out what you are, not what you imagine you are because you want to make yourself what you ought to be. Most people don't change because they don't see their own faults. That's by Paramanzi Yogananda and it's from Man's Eternal Quest. Now I'm going to share something from Buddhism Without Beliefs, this book. It's a contemporary guide to awakening. It's by Stephen Batchelor. Hi Sol, hi Gabriella. Much love to you all. Right, I'm going to read this passage. It's on integrity. A monk asked young men, what are the teachings of a whole lifetime? Young men said, an appropriate statement. I'm just reading your comment now, Joanne. Yes, exactly, Joanne. It doesn't mean that we can't be aware of what's happening, but we need to remain in our own integrity, our own truth, because that's all there is. The resolve to awaken requires the integrity not to be hurt, not to hurt anyone in the process. Dharma practice cannot be abstracted from the way we interact with the world. Our deeds, words and intentions create an ethical ambience that either supports or weakens resolve. If we behave in a way that harms either others or ourselves, the capacity to focus on the task will be weakened. 
We will feel disturbed, distracted and uneasy. The practice will have less effect as though the vitality of resolve is being drained. Ethical integrity is rooted in the sense of who we are and what kind of reality we inhibit. inhabit. Sorry. That we are isolated, anxious creatures in a hostile world may not be a conscious philosophical view, but a gut feeling buried beneath the image of the compassionate and responsible person projected to the world. Only when one is frightened or overwhelmed by greed or hate is this underlying attitude revealed. Then each one experiences himself pitted against the rest of the world, one desperate soul struggling to survive among others. There are many ways to hurt others when we feel like this. From killing to injuring them physically or depriving them of what's rightfully theirs to abuse or taking advantage of them, from lying, speaking unkindly about them behind their backs, or uttering cruel and barbed remarks to waste their time in, in senseless chatter. Integrity entails not merely refraining from over, overt acts of this kind, but also recognising how we contemplate such behaviour in our thoughts. Repeat it repeat it through fantasy or prepare for it even though we lose our nerve before carrying it out. There are also moments when we experience ourselves not at odds with others but as participants in shared reality. Now this is what I'm talking about today, the shared reality. There is one reality, this world. And there's an ultimate reality where everything is perfect, everything is divine. Everything is appearing and disappearing into that divinity, into that silence, into that space. The ultimate reality where nothing is wrong, nothing ever happens, and everything is just as it should be, as it always is. I'll read that bit again. There are also moments when we experience ourselves not at odds with others but as participants in shared reality and empathetic, as empathetic beings in a participatory, participatory reality we cannot without losing our integrity hurt abuse rob or lie to others ethical integrity originates in empathy for then we take the well-being of others to heart and we are moved to be generous and caring our thoughts words and deeds are based on a sense of what we have in common rather than what divides us but just because we feel deeply for someone's plight and are motiva motivated by the noblest intentions, this does not ensure that what we do will be for the best. Empathy alone will not prevent us from making mistakes. While rooted in empathy, integrity requires courage and intelligence as well, because every significant ethical choice entails risk. And while we cannot know in advance the consequences of the choices we make, we can learn to become more ethically intelligent. Ethical intelligence is cultivated by learning from concrete mistakes. We can discern when a reactive habit kicks in and prompts us to adopt the familiar path of least resistance. We can notice when empathy cap capitulates to fear or self-interest. We can be alert for face-saving words and gestures that give an impression of empathy while letting us off the hook. And we can recognise when we are evading the crisis of risk. How often do we refrain from acting out of fear or how our actions might be received? To let such a moment slip away can be agonising. 
To combat such fear requires the courage to live in a less self-centred and more compassionate way. However daunting a situation may seem, as soon as we say or do something it is suddenly transformed. When the door of hesitation is unlocked, we enter a dynamic, fluid world which challenges us to act and act again. The most soul-searching meditation on ethics leaves the world intact. A single word or deed can, be trans can transform it forever. Ethical integrity requires both the intelligence to understand the present situation as the fruition of former choices and the courage to engage with it as the arena for the creation of what is to come. It empowers us to embrace the ambiguity of a present that is simul simultaneously tied to an irre irrevocable past and free for an undetermined future. Ethical integrity is not moral certainty, a priori certainty about right and wrong is at odds with a changing and unreliable world, where the future lies open waiting to be born from choices and acts. Such certainty may be consoling and strengthening, but it can blunt awareness of the uniqueness of each ethical moment. When we are faced with unprecedented and unrepeatable complexities of this moment, the question is not, what is the right thing to do, but what is the compassionate thing to do? This question can be approached with integrity, but not with certainty. In accepting that every action is a risk, integrity embraces the fallibility that certainly disdainfully eschews. Ethical integrity is threatened as much by attachment to the security of what is known as by the fear of the insecurity of what is not known or what is unknown. It is liable to be remorse buffeted by the winds of desire and fear, doubt and worry, fantasy and egoism. The more we give in to these things, the more our integrity is eroded and we find ourselves carried along on a wave of psychological and social habit. When responding to a moral dilemma, we just repeat the gestures and words of a parent, an authority figure a religious text. While moral conditioning may be necessary for social stability, it is inadequate as a paradigm for integrity. Occasionally though, we act in a way that startles us. A friend asks our advice about a tricky moral choice, yet instead of offering him consoling platitudes or the wisdom of someone else, we say something that we did not know we knew. Such gestures and words spring from the body and tongue with a shocking spontaneity. We cannot call them mine, but neither have we copied them from others. Compassion has dissolved the strange fold of self and we taste for a few exhilarating seconds the creative freedom of awakening. I'm just going to read your comment, Dave. Part of the part of the path of awakening that people can experience, the path to enlightenment, to freedom, is the dropping away of what we believed was our truth and our reality, what we identified with the most. 
what we felt that we couldn't exist without. And so quite often what happens is people lose everything they have come to understand as who they are so that they can grow into who they truly are without those things forming some kind of attachment for the mind to enable that person to let go and to truly become who and what they need to become. So with you, Dave, it can be seen as a tragedy, of course, to lose everything. But it can be seen as an opportunity to rebuild life in a new way, to experience life in a new way. To be free from those things that may have held you back in some way. What? can seem like a disaster, a challenge, intense suffering, when it's viewed from the mind, that's how things look. But when you can move beyond the mind and the mind's interpretation of experience, then we can see that everything is shifting and changing, so that life can be experienced in a freer and more beautiful way. There are things that will come out of this day that you have not yet experienced and there are many gifts in this experience for you. And although it may not feel like that right now, it will unfold and you'll be able to share this story as part of your life's experience with others to help them as they go through similar challenges. When we lose our homes, our families, our relationships, what we've come to really know as part of our identity, to what we've completely accepted as who we are on some level. When those things are taken away, or when grace takes them away, when God takes them away, it's so that we can see what is truly real. What is real without all of those things distracting us. Yes, of course, Dave, you have your soul, you have your body, you have your mind. And right now, what is truly wrong. This is the thing when we sit in silence and we look at how everything is. When we stop and we bring ourselves right here, right now. We bring all our attention, all our focus to this moment, to what's right in front of us. We come to realise something, which is that all our needs are always taken care of. That just for this moment, right here, right now, there are no problems. And if we allow ourselves to really let go in this moment, to be fully present with what is, we start to notice 
and start to notice a peace arising from within, a silence arising from within. And all burdens can simply dissolve into the silence, dissolve into the presence. to read another chapter from this book. I think I'll read the chapter on freedom. Therefore, we know that unawakened, even a Buddha is a sentient being. And that even a sentient being, if he is awakened in an instant of thought, is a Buddha. And that's by Hugh Neng. When a man is released from a prison, he recovers his freedom. The moment he steps outside the gate, he is freed from his sentence, the warden's the walls, bars and locks of his cell. The world lies open before him. He is free to realise the possibilities it now offers. High neck. And he is free for others, available for relationships, available for whatever demands and challenges others present him. Freedom is never absolute. It is always relative to something else. Freedom from constraints. Freedom to act. Freedom for others. The former prisoner is still constrained by the laws of society. The resources available to him. The limits of his culture, knowledge and skills and ultimately the state of his body and the laws of nature. Similarly, the freedom of awakening is a relative freedom. From the constraints of self-centred confusion and turmoil, from the craving for a fixed identity, from the compulsion to contrive a perfect situation, from identification with preconceived opinions and from the anguish that originates in such attachments. The Buddha himself was still constrained by the world view of his time, his own language, knowledge and skills, his awareness of what his society would tolerate the availability of resources and technologies, the geographical and political barriers that restricted him to a limited area of northern India, his physical body and the laws of nature. Yet the world lay open to him in an unprecedented way. He was free to creatively realise its possibilities unhindered by the cravings that had previously determined his choices. Free to imagine an appropriate response to the anguish of others. Free to cultivate an authentic path that embraced all aspects of human life. Free to form a community of friendship and free to create a culture of awakening that would survive long after his death. 
and he was free for others. He altruistically surrendered his personal well-being for their sake. He made himself available for whatever demands and challenges others presented him with. Hi Patricia. Much love to you all. The freedom of awakening is grounded in the cessation of craving. Such freedom is possible because the changing contingent, contingent ambiguous and creative character of reality is by its very nature free. We are our own jailers. We keep ourselves unfree by clinging out of confusion and fear to a self that exists independently of all conditions. Instead of accepting and understanding things as they are, we seek independence from them in the fiction of an isolated selfhood. Ironically, this alienated self-centeredness is then confused with individual freedom. The aim of Dharma practice is to free ourselves from this illusion of freedom. This is achieved by understanding the anguish that accompanies such delusive independence and letting go of the confusion and craving that hold it in place. Cultivation of the path begins with an authentic vision of the changing contingent and creative character of ourself and the world. While initially, initially the experience of reality, intrinsic freedom, may be momentary and sporadic, Dharma practice embraces a way of life that values this experience as normative rather than ex exceptional. Although we still may be overwhelmed by turbulent patterns of habit, our commitment to this vision of freedom remains unwavering. To determine, to undetermine, the fixated, frozen view of things that traps us in cycles of craving and anguish, we need to cultivate awareness of the freedom present in each moment of experience. As long as you are mindful of the breath, it carries on in its own way. But as soon as you start paying attention to it, you tend to constrain it. Even if you tell yourself, just observe it as it is, the very act of your self-conscious observation makes it stilted and controlled. You might have the sense that I am breathing, rather than it breathes. Try this. At the end of your next out-breath, just wait for the following in-breath to occur. As though you were a cat waiting for a mouse to emerge from its hole. You know that the next in-breath will come. You have no idea precisely when, so while your attention remains as alert and poised, in the present as that of a cat's. It is free from any intention to control what happens next. Without expectation, just wait. Then suddenly it happens and you catch it. Breathing. It is strangely exhilarating, even unnerving, to be aware of the breath in this way. As a focus for mindfulness, the breath is the one bodily function that can be both autonomous and volitional. Unlike, for example, the heartbeat. While the breath may initially serve as an object of concentration, by letting go of any urge to control it, we can witness in its rhythmic motions an intrinsic freedom of reality itself. I'll read that last bit again. We can witness in its rhythmic motions the intrinsic freedom of reality itself. And if we look at this, this is a great analogy for life, that we don't need to hold on to anything because everything is just simply 
happening. Everything is happening. And so there's nothing that we need to control. And the more we can let go and the more we can allow life to happen, to flow through us, the more beauty and the more magic we can experience. Because the idea of control is coming from the mind. It's coming from the ego's need to make things a certain way so that we can feel a certain way. But if we can just relax and be here now, as Ramdas said, And allow life to flow from that space of now, that open-hearted space of presence and possibilities. And life becomes a celebration. Life becomes a dance. A dance with the unknown. A dance with the magical. A dance with the mystery. And we don't need to know. We don't need to know the outcome of anything. And we don't need to control. Breathing is the movement of life. The vital process that connects the body with its environment. The more we open and deepen awareness of the breath and the body, the more we understand the intrinsic dynamism of our entire experience. Nothing stands still for a moment. Breath, heartbeat, body, feelings, thoughts, environment are facets of our individual are facets of our individual in indivisible interactive system no part of which can really be claimed as me or mine why then do we compulsively hold ourselves aloof and apart of all of this what constraints and inhibition inhibits us from fully participating in this experience we may know full well that such participation will not obliterate us it is perfectly compatible with the same detachment of ironic self-regard. Hi, Sass. Yet still we identify with this ghostly self hovering above the eternally isolated, hovering above eternally isolated from the very process of life. As a result, the entire interactive system feels as though it is jammed and we feel numb, blocked and frustrated unfree, repeatedly embracing the dynamic, precarious and selfless flow of experience gradually erodes this ingrained conviction of our separate existence. To enhance this further still, it helps to let go not just of attachment to a fixed self, fixed self but of all views that confine and fix experience. This can be achieved by recognising that however we describe it, even as dynamic, precarious and selfless, what is happening is utterly mysterious. As mindful awareness becomes stiller and clearer, experience becomes not only more vivid, but simultaneously more baffling. The more deeply we know something in this way, the more deeply we don't know it. As we attentively listen to the rain, it's raining here, believe, <laughs> believe it or not. As we attentively listen to the rain or look at a chair, these familiar things become not more, only more apparent, but also more puzzling. As we sit there aware of the breath, it is on one hand ordinary and obvious, but on the other, a mystery that we breathe at all. Attending to this dimension of experience where descriptions and explanations fail challenges assumptions about how we know. Experience cannot be accounted for by simply confining it to a conceptual category. Its ultimate ambiguity is that it is simultaneously knowable and unknowable. 
no matter how well we may know something to witness its intrinsic freedom impels the humble admission, I don't really know it. Such unknowing is the end of the track, the point beyond which thinking can proceed no further. This unknowing is the basis of deep agnostic agnosticism. I don't know if I pronounced that right. <laughs> when belief and opinion are suspended, the mind has nowhere to rest. We are free to begin a radically other kind of questioning. This questioning is present within, unknowing itself. As soon as awareness finds itself baffled and puzzled by rainfall, a chair, the breath, they present themselves as questions. Habitual assumptions and descriptions suddenly fail. And we hear our stammering voices cry out, what is this, or simply what, or why, or perhaps no words at all, just with a question mark. The sheer presence of things is startling. They provoke awe, wonder, incomprehension, shock. Not just the mind, but the entire organism feels perplexed. This can be unsettling. Awareness now can be derailed easily by flashes of speculative thought, spontaneous bursts of poetry, which no matter how inspired and original, cast us back into the categorised and familiar world. The task of Dharma practice is to, sus is to sustain this perplexity within the context of calm, clear and centred awareness. Such perplexity is neither frustrated nor merely curious about a specific detail of experience. It is an intense focused questioning into the totality of what is unfolding at any given moment. It is the engine that drives awareness into the heart of what is unknown. The questioning that emerges from the knowing differs from conventional inquiry in that it has no interest in finding an answer. The questioning starts at the point where the descriptions and explanations end. It has already let go of the constraints and limitations of conceptual categories. It recognises that mysteries are not solved as though they were problems and then forgotten. The deeper we penetrate a mystery, the more mysterious it becomes. This perplexed questioning is the central path itself. In refusing to be drawn into the answers of yes and no, it is this, it is not that. It lets go of the extremes of affirmation and neg negation, something and nothing, like life itself. It just keeps going, free from the need to hold any fixed positions, including those of Buddhism, or any other religion for that matter. It prevents the quality of awareness from being a passive, routinized stance, which may accord with a belief system, but renders experience numb and opaque. Perplexity keeps awareness on its toes. It reveals experience as transparent, radiant and unimpeded. Questioning is the track on which the centre person moves. Fired with intensity but free from turbulence, the compulsion for answers. Questioning is constant, is, is content. Questioning is content just to let things be. There is not even a hidden agenda at work behind the scenes. Expectations of goals and rewards, such as enlightenment, are recognised for what they are. Last-ditch attempts by the ghostly self to subvert the process to its own ends. The more we become conscious of the mysterious unfolding of life, the clearer it becomes that its purpose is not to fulfil the expectations of our ego. We can put into words only the question it poses, and then let go, listen, and wait. Reality is intrinsically free because it is changing, uncertain, contingent and empty. It is a dynamic play of relationships. Awakening to this reveals our own intrinsic freedom, for we too are by na nature a dynamic play of relationships. 
An authentic vision of this freedom is a ground of individual freedom and creative autonomy. This experience, however, is something we, reco we recover at specific moments in time. As long as we are locked into an assumption that self and things are unchanging, unambiguous, absolute, opaque and solid, we will remain correspondingly confined, alienated, numbed, frustrated and unfree. Hi Claire. Yet in practice life can be so neatly split into the dualities of free and unfree, awakened and unawakened. While such char char categories are clear cut, life is ambiguous. Freedom can be both recovered and lost again. Awakening is the recovery of that awesome freedom into which we are born, but for which we have substituted the persuado independence of a separate self. No matter how much it frightens us, no matter how much we resist it, such freedom is right at hand. Right here, right now. It may break into our lives at any time, whether we seek it or not, it's all by grace enabling us to glimpse a reality that is simultaneously more familiar and more elusive than anything we have ever known, in which we find ourselves both profoundly alone and profoundly connected to everything. Yet the force of habit is such that suddenly it is lost again and we are back to our unambiguous normality. Through counteracting this force of habit, Dharma practices it practice has two objectives, to let go of self-centred craving so that our lives become gradually more awake and to be receptive to the sudden eruption of awakening into our lives at any moment. Awakening is both a linear process of freedom that is cultivated over time and an ever-present possibility of freedom. The central path is both a track with a beginning and an end and a formless potentiality at the very centre of experience. Whew. That was beautiful, wasn't it? That was an extract from Buddhism Without Beliefs, The Contemporary Guide to Awakening by Stephen Batchelor. Fabulous book, right on my wavelength. Right, if my battery doesn't run out, I'm going to um, put a song on for all of us. Um, so hang on.